Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, which is the last lecture in the present Tipperary People and Places series. Barry's topic tonight is the architectural heritage of County Tipperary. And Barry has worked in this field for many, many years. He is with the National Inventory of Architectural Heritage, and he has lectured widely on the subject, both in Ireland and abroad. So without further ado, I welcome Barry, and I can assure you, you're in for a very enjoyable and interesting lecture. Does anybody know where this building is? No, it's the creamery in Emily. It's a, it's a lovely building. It's a very nice building. I could have put up some, uh, you know, mansion house or whatever, or a courthouse, but this is more typical of the architectural heritage of, of the county. And the vernacular is just a subset. It's just part of the architectural heritage, but it's um, often an unrecognized part. So that's the thing that is, you know, most exciting for me, and that's what I've been dealing with since uh, the mid-1980s, <laughs> well, mid to late 1980s, is uh, traditional architecture throughout the country. Um, just a couple of things to note on this slide is the different materials. So you've got the stonework, which is very like the stonework of some railway buildings, railway bridges and embankments and so on. You have the steps, which would be in concrete, up to the doors, the loading doors. Um, you've got, I think, a slate roof, but very frequently there's a corrugated roof. And there's also the plaque there, which is an enamel plaque. So all of these different elements are important. They're part of the local scene. If this building accidentally met an accident with a bulldozer or something like that, it would represent a loss in the locality. So it's local architecture, but no less important because it's local. Local doesn't mean unimportant. So we were just, this is just uh, an idea of the scale of the different types of buildings within TIP's architectural heritage. Probably no prize for guessing where this one is. Yep. So it's, this is a building purportedly 17th century. Now that I, I don't necessarily accept, but it is a rather, in, rather interesting building uh, on the edge of the town. Now at a more typical scale for a vernacular building, vernacular means, build, means of the people. These are the buildings that your average person was able to build and building with local materials but within a traditional mindset and that's the important thing. So no architects, no draftspersons, none of that. No drawing boards. If there's a sniff of a drawing board, it is not a vernacular building. So this, this building here in the middle, it's sort of um, a tourless direction, it's mid-tip. Uh, I'm not going to remember the townland names for every single, uh, every single building in this, so you can forgive me for that. It's a fairly typical vernacular building. A uh, nice little porch, little flat por roof porch, a gabled roof, lovely surroundings and context, uh, a nice stone wall, lovely gates and gate piers. All of this is part of the picture and it's all important. Then getting a bit grander, this is at uh, Ballinure, uh, which I passed through, passed by this house on the way here. At Ballinure, Ballinure is sort of, um, um, it's, 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 a, it's like Slane, it's like a small version of Slane. You have this um, crossroads with uh, prominent buildings on each corner. Now in the case of Ballinure, it's sort of missing something on the fourth corner, but otherwise it's really sort of an architectural set piece statement. The buildings are in fairly good nick. One of them was a former barracks. Uh, so it, there's lots of um, nice details on this building, uh, sort of a frilly porch, you might say quite elegant chimneys, uh, nice timber sash windows. Uh, timber sash windows are really important to retain. Too many buildings have lost their old windows. They've been replaced with, you know, in an earlier era, metal, uh, maybe steel, later aluminium, now PVC, which is the death knell of the visual appearance of so many buildings. So it's really, really important to hang on to timber windows. And uh, they can be, um, you know, enhanced internally with um, secondary glazing, they can, they can be improved to um, stop up, uh, you know, uh, gaps and so on that would otherwise make the building drafty. So there's ways and means of improving buildings without doing drastic things to their uh, appearance or indeed their interior. So going up again in scale, this is a building in North Tip. Um, there are many really fine buildings uh, around the county. Tip is actually really blessed 
was having an, you know, a really fantastic architectural heritage. And I can say that without, I won't say without fear of contradiction because I can always be contradicted, but there are, you know, lots of grand houses because of the nature of the county. It's always been a wealthy county agriculturally, good network of strong market towns, good rivers running through it, great milling traditions, often instigated by the Quakers, for example. So there's all of this strength, and then a deep sort of medieval base to the whole thing with a really strong agricultural underpinning. We also get quite a few 17th century houses in Tipperary, probably more than any other county. And very interestingly, you get buildings with uh, different periods in them. So for, so for example, Mabarnan House, which is only about a mile away from where I'm living, uh, its earliest bit is probably a medieval tower house. Then it has a later bit, which could be 16th century. It has an early 18th century block and has an early 19th century front block. So it's got at least four periods of architectural history in the same building. And this is something which is quite a strong feature of the county. Then of course you've got the mega scale of the likes of Knocklofty. Huge, big, rambling, uh, Palladian style mansions, which uh, are, uh, <laughs> I'm sure, a real headache to keep clean and to, and to uh, heat and all the rest of it. But they represent an era where labor and money wasn't really uh, an object for a certain stratum within society. Uh, we all know that it's, uh, Knocklofty has become a bit of a sorry tale. And that is also, unfortunately, uh, the other side of the picture and tip. There is a fantastic heritage, but is it being adequately uh, looked after? That's always an issue. This is just um, a rough idea of, now there should be, no, there should be a, date, a dating uh, caption to this. But this is just a rough idea of the dating brackets for the buildings that the National Inventory of Architectural Heritage has recorded for TIP. There's a huge number are from the, the 19th century. The vast majority of buildings in any given county will be 19th century. It's essentially a 19th century architectural heritage out there, but with a good dollop of 18th century buildings. So you've got maybe one third um, or more 19th century, and then you've got about another third, which are first half of the 18th, uh, sorry, second half of the 18th, and then another maybe quarter less than a quarter, maybe a fifth, which are first half of the 18th. And that's quite a good dollop, actually. You know, because you get counties like, say, Galway or Mayo, where it would be generally a much later architectural heritage. So a lot of buildings would post-date 1800, and you wouldn't get that many. 17th century, you'd find almost no 17th century houses, and you'd find very few 18th century, really. But in tip, you're going to get all this. Then there's a good few, which are medieval to 1700. So that's quite, um, that's quite interesting. That's around about one eighth, maybe one tenth of the whole thing. And that, that's quite substantial for any, for any county. You also see that uh, 1901 and following is a very, very small portion. Now that's not unusual for um, any given county. Uh, but now in the architectural inventory, we will include buildings up till about 1980, which is say about 40 odd years ago. So as time goes on, buildings which were uh, not looked upon as being part of the architectural heritage, gradually come into the, into the ambit of architectural heritage. So that's uh, not really uh, probably very surprising. So you have, for example, in Dublin, um, our headquarters building is the Custom House, which is a grand late 18th century building of probably international importance. Directly across it is the uh, Bussaurus building by Michael Scott, uh, about 1940. Also of international importance. Two, it's the only part of Ireland probably where you have two internationally important buildings right beside each other. But they're very different style. One is sort of ultra classical in style, neoclassical, and the other one is uh, modernist in style. But both of them are part of the architectural heritage. Now I'd also say that a corrugated iron shed down the back lane is part of the architectural heritage. Not too many people would necessarily agree with that, but I think I could make a case for it. So moving on then into uh, towns. Cashel, yep, that's Cashel. Uh, the lovely thing about the towns of Tipperary is that they're not Baron Housemans Paris, right? Uh, Housemans Paris was built on the, if you like, the sort of clearance 
of a lot of the medieval city of Paris. So you get the Arc de Triomphe with all of the radial spokes coming out of it, the grand avenues, and they're leading to other, like what they would call in London, a circus, uh, glorified roundabout, essentially. We don't have that in Ireland, which is fantastic. Now, the nearest we get to that is probably uh, the likes of O'Connell Street in Dublin, which leads on to O'Connell Bridge. You've got two streets coming out of it. You've got Parnell Square. Or in Limerick, where you've got um, a Newtown Manhattan, which is a very formal architectural quarter from the Georgian period. But generally speaking, our towns are higgledy-piggledy. They're irregular, and that is their chief characteristic. So here in Cashel, as in all of the tip towns, the street line and the roof line goes up and down. It's like jaggedy teeth, and that's the character of the place. You also get in and out on certain streets. You get a mix and gather of shop fronts, window styles, architectural detailing. So you have, for example, coins or um, plaster coins. Uh, you will have hopefully nicely preserved cast iron downpipes. Um, so you get, you know, this, I think this is a fairly modern shop front, but it's in a traditional style and it hangs together. And you'll get a, a variety of render details. Render details to buildings are really very important. Uh, there was, I know there was um, a grant application, for example, for uh, another county, which involved um, taking off the concrete render on a house and replacing it with lime plaster. Now that's one case where I would say don't do it. Normally, cement render is not good for a building. It prevents it from breathing. But this particular building had no or very few signs of problems in the plaster work, but the plaster detailing was very good. So you can actually sometimes say, look, we want to hang on to concrete. Concrete is not necessarily a bad thing, notwithstanding mica and pyrite, yes. Concrete has got us into a whole heap of trouble, but it's modern concrete. Uh, old concrete doesn't get us into quite the same amount of trouble. <laughs> so, but there are lots of concrete structures in TIP and elsewhere which are meritorious. And like the NIH wouldn't have um, any hesitation about including them. They might be a nightmare to conserve. That's the only problem. Like if you think of, say, board to board pneumonia chimneys in the, in the Midlands, uh, they were made of uh, reinforced concrete. They are certainly quite difficult. <laughs> to keep in good condition and repaired. Um, another town? It's Kerr. And the, the, the big thing about Kerr is this detail, label details. These are little fancy um, cornices or drip, drip labels, we call them as well. They, they, they break the fall of water that might otherwise run down the window. And this is the work of uh, Tinsley's who are architects, who I'll mention uh, shortly. And they essentially rebuilt or refenestrated a lot of the town of Kerr. So Kerr is known for these windows. And you'll find them on Church Street, you'll find them on Castle Street, you'll find them around the square as well. It hangs the town of Kerr architecturally together. It's a very strong uh, motif in the town. I'm um, sorry, the other thing is also uh, the shop fronts have stone uh, built into them. They're actually, um, they're essentially stone fronts. That's another thing. Um, bottom left, it's about 200 yards down the road. <laughs> yeah, it's here, it's here in uh, Turles. Also really, really good uh, details. You'll get it on the square, on Liberty Square as well. There's lots of really good render details. And that's a very important feature of the town of, uh, of the town of Turles. Turles is quite a rich architectural heritage. Uh, very little of it is, shall we say, mind-blowingly internationally important or anything like that, but it holds together very, very well. There's also the Ams houses, for example, the Stanix Arms houses, which are exceptional. I think they're really, really fine. But there's lots of good buildings. The cathedral, obviously, is the set piece of the town, I would say. Liberty Square is a very fine and actually really quite intact urban space. And then we have What's great? Rosemary Square, which is a delight with that beautiful fountain. Um, so fountains, drinking places, pumps, uh, horse troughs, all of this, are, there's a, these are really important parts of the context of that, the furniture of, of the public spaces and the streets. So then we go on to, this is Clanmel, the key in Clanmel, just, just essentially called the key, <laughs> but it's called different names at different times. A very strong feature of the town is their awareness of the river and the floodability of the river, raising 
the main uh, floor of the house up above uh, flood level. It's the sort of thing you get in continental countries as well. The less, the less the basement flood, they know the river's going to flood, so they just give in to the river, no big deal, and then they, they make sure they're nice, liter literally high and, high and dry. So that's probably the origin of the phrase. Now next to it is um, a bit of an abomination of uh, recent architecture. There's a lot of fairly cruddy uh, recent uh, well, building. Uh, Cashel has a measure of it. Clonmel has more than its fair share of it. So this stuff will not be part of the architectural heritage uh, under, I think, anybody's <laughs> in anybody's book. That said, I mean, the, the, for example, the, uh, the bungalow gets an awful bad uh, press. And I would say that it's time now to start including some bungalows into the architectural heritage, maybe the early ones. Um, but as time goes on, uh, probably a few more. So I wouldn't rule out um, you know, 1970s, 1980s buildings as having architectural, some architectural quality. People from abroad often look at our bungalows as a really interesting part of the built scene in this country, to an extent that maybe we're not aware of that I wouldn't be aware. They, they would see them as being very particular and very Irish, which they are. So this is just a, a door detail, the same, I think, the same building. And you can see that this is a, a really fine door case, as it's called. It's got a panel door, which is very much in keeping with, if it's not original, it's certainly very much in keeping with the building. Um, and you've got the skylight. Now, the skylights are worth looking at in any town. And once you get your eye into them, you start to see them everywhere and you start to identify different patterns. There are cobweb patterns, petals, peacock's tails, plain ones, all sorts of um, examples of them. They're really interesting. And often in any particular locality, particularly towns, it's often the details that, are, that provide the real interest. The buildings themselves might be fairly modest, but it's, it's often the details, the little incidental details that really jump out as saying, look, I'm an interesting building or I'm an interesting detail, a bit of ironwork or whatever. This is also on the quay, uh, sort of a grander building altogether. Now this one is built on the flat. You see the ivy creeping onto it. Ivy can be very pleasant to look at, but if it gets into cracks in the plaster, it can cause a certain amount of uh, difficulty, I would say, and water ingress. And then that's the doorway of that building. You can see it's a different style. Uh, Ionic capitals, as they're called. Uh, essentially, these doorways are classical inspired, so Greek and Roman uh, antecedents. Uh, you had the, um, the children, or the, wel the wealthy or, the ch or their children, they went on the grand tour of Europe. So they went to Italy, they went to Naples, they, they went to ancient uh, Athens and so on, and they brought back ideas with them. And particularly architects who explored these countries, the, the, the Greek lands and the Roman territories, in the 19th century and 18th century, brought back um, architectural motifs from those periods. And you can see them all over the place. They inform most of the formal architecture of the country. And you can also see that the fan light is very different. It's a, a very simply divided one. Uh, steps, railings, all part of the scene, all really important. Um, a really fine, Summer Hill in Nina, it's a really, really fine street. It's as good a street as you'll find anywhere in the country. And that's, that's the point. Tip has stuff which is as good, often better, than other parts of the country. So that's again reason why I'd say that people should be very proud of the architectural heritage of the county. Again, another doorway, a very different fan light. Also, you can see the boot scrape. These are often very uh, ornate cast iron pieces. Also, you have lots of nice render details. Windows and window surrounds, uh, little sometimes very flimsy keystone details, uh, just purely decorative. They don't, do, they don't do anything. But also you get contrasting render, so quite plain render, and then fussier um, Harold render uh, as well. So differentiating different stories. Also in Nina, also on um, Summer Hill. And what, what this building has is a carriageway into the back, as has this. So that, the backlands of these buildings were very important. Today, backlands end up getting used for car parking and almost nothing else. Sometimes you get a, a, a group of backlands, which then becomes like a municipal car park or something like that. But it can, it can really hollow out the center of a town. You know, it might not do anything obviously uh, bad to it from, say, the street front, 
but the back land tends to be uh, pretty miserable and poorly designed and so on you know that also tells you that you know that there were uh, there was accommodation for for horses in the back that there were sheds and so on at the back sometimes these houses are right on the edge of towns and you're straight into farmland and all the rest of it so you know the country towns are really part of the rural scene as much as an urban scene another example so they're they're all quite different in their presentation this is this is what makes a street like Summerhill rich the fact that they are different one to the next they're practically all different with different details it's a beautiful it's now used as a flower shop but it's a really really fine building uh, on the main street the sort of castle end i suppose you call it with the main street in carrick again lots of really nice details this is quite a typical um over light as we call it fan light if it's rounded and over light if it's if it's um square or flat or rectangular so uh, nice simple applied lettering you get lettering in all sorts of styles sort of gold work and so on and um, but this is quite simple but really nice the windows perfectly preserved nice cornice details mullions and transoms all that stuff it's a really good example of a, a good urban building with uh, a very nice shop front tip town possibly my favorite town in county tipperary tipperary town has a, an outstanding architectural heritage Again, none of it is necessarily, it doesn't rank with the Taj Mahal or anything like that, but th what there is in Tip Town is a whole series of arcaded shop fronts. Really, really nice. And once again, you get your eye in, you start to see the details. So just beautiful uh, capitals. Again, faux or pretend uh, keystones. A very, it's a very typical detail. And then, you know, the bases are all very nicely chamfered and so on and often with um, you know, guards, window guards. Because on a market day, you might get the cattle going the rampage and they go straight through a plate glass window. So frequently you'd have some sort of protection for plate glass against uh, the beasties. And again, gorgeous work on the, um, the cornice there. But you'll get that, the, the old uh, permanent, Irish permanent building on the main street has the same sort of detail. And then the side streets have, uh, often have equally good buildings. I'm always saying that Tip Town is an open-air art gallery. It's really good. The worst thing you could do to Tip Town is spend a lot of money on it because that would involve improving it to an extent. You know, unless you're painting it, maintaining it. Like we need to move from, uh, I think, a new build culture to a maintenance culture. Like we're not brilliant in this country yet maintaining our historic buildings. And we tend to have too much emphasis on building new structures. And that's not a very sustainable approach to anything, to our pockets, to the environment, to crafts. We need to keep crafts going. And to keep them going, we need to maintain what we have. So this is another detail in Tip Town. Um, it's a feature of the town that you get these um, double windows with a column or colonnette in the middle. And again, you can see uh, the little bar to protect against cattle. Little, just a very simple uh, wrought iron piece here. Post boxes. Typical cast iron uh, post box. Vior, I think it is, or is it Eor? Can't quite make it out. These are mass produced in Britain. They are up there, they're, they're mass produced in their tens of thousands. They were used in Britain and then in the colonies like Ireland. You'll also find them uh, further afield. And these sum up so much of Victorian creativity. If you want to take any era as being creative, go to the Victorians, late 19th century, 1850, say to 1900. That's when everything was happening. That was Silicon Valley multiplied by 100. And I would recommend the magazine called The Irish Builder to anybody who's interested in following the trend of innovation in the Victorian period is actually quite uh, stunning, really. Uh, the inventiveness of people, the, the materials they were exploring, they were trying everything. But cast iron is something that became a huge thing in the 19th century for all sorts of buildings and railway buildings and post boxes. Uh, the post box is obviously symbolizes communication throughout the world. 
Uh, it's a piece of street furniture. It's something that adorns any street anywhere in the world. And it's cast iron, so it's, it's quality engineering. Mulnahan. So a nationalist monument from Mulnahan. That's also part of the architectural heritage of the county. The NIH doesn't just include buildings, you know, from uh, you know, houses, the courthouse and so on. We also include things like wells, pumps, street furniture, statues, all that sort of thing. Even stretches of good curbside, for example, uh, can be included as part of the architectural heritage. It's also part of, the post box is also a part of engineering heritage and artistic heritage. There's so many different things going for it. And social, of course, because it connects people. And then I mentioned earlier the, about details. It's the, the Church of the Sacred Heart in Bursley. The, there's two really, really fine churches. There's lots of really good churches in Tip. Now, some of them were got at in the 20th century and blamed on the Vatican. But we do know better. It wasn't the Vatican that is to be held responsible for, for the um, destruction of the interiors of a lot of the Catholic churches. Uh, but there are, there's a really good uh, church in Barcelay and then not too far away in Templemore. And there's a very similar feel to the interior of both buildings. They're both really excellent buildings. Um, St. Michael's in Tipperary Town is also an outstanding building. And there are, there are others around the county. So this is part, of, this is a detail of the sandstone work of the portal, the, the main doorway into uh, the church in Borsalay. It's, I think it's one of the loveliest buildings in the county. Cullen, the little village of Cullen, uh, the pub at Quinlan's, which is beautiful render details. You don't normally get that on a pub. But uh, this is, a, again, a really, really uh, pleasant building. This is, one the, this is from Nina. This is Summerhill again in Nina. And it's a really elaborate uh, cast iron, I suppose not, not quite a porch to a house, but just beautiful, beautiful details. This sort of thing is called cresting. And you sometimes get it on the uh, roofs, the ridges of roofs of building. It's usually in uh, cast iron work, but it, it can be replicated in, uh, in pottery or clay as, as well. And uh, just really beautiful railings, really elaborate. Uh, naturally, the churches in general will have a very high standard of artistic work, uh, whether they're Church of Ireland churches or Catholic churches. There will be um, really excellent quality in the stonework, in the detailing of windows, doorways, and so on. And then internally, internally, Protestant churches tend to be a bit plainer than Catholic churches. The intact Catholic churches with uh, stained glass and elaborate pulpits, etc., etc., can be uh, essentially art galleries. Like I think you can think of churches as being art galleries as well as places of worship. I think that's uh, part of their um, importance. Um, this is a little detail of a building in Ross Cray. Uh, Bunkers Hill, Russ Cray, I think at least it used to be called Bunkers Hill, with sort of appropriately a sort of um, shamrock detail in the barge board or to the hood over the doorway. So, you know, two different types of ports, if you like, very different materials, but both of them are showy. They're basically saying, look, both saying that, um, you know, they're announcing themselves, they're announcing the doorway of the building and uh, providing a bit of decoration that you might not otherwise have. This building, Clonmel. It's the John Christian House in Clonmel. I'm glad to see that it's, it seems to have been fixed up recently and back in use. It did languish for quite a long time uh, in disuse, which was um, very bad. But it's, um, it's an 18th century house of some considerable importance to the town. A lot of slate hanging. And slate hanging is a feature of uh, Clonmel and uh, Carrick, uh, Waterford, likes of Kinsale, it's often associated with uh, riverside or coastal towns, particularly in the south of the country. It's essentially like weather cladding over your uh, lime plaster. And the good thing about uh, the, one of the features of this building is the quite elaborate lozenge decoration on the building, which uh, 
it, it hasn't necessarily weathered terribly well, it hasn't been necessarily that well maintained over the decades, but it's still there. And I'm just glad that the building has been fixed up recently. So this is the little creamery at Emily. Not all cream, creameries are as um, architectural as this. Um, I'm working on a book on corrugated buildings at the moment, island, island wide corrugated buildings. And quite a few creameries were made from corrugated. The sides as well as the roof were corrugated. Uh, it could be thrown up quite quickly and you know even moved around this is a, a mill up in it's up in north tip it's just a really i suppose really intact building uh, unusual proportions uh, we're more used to having mills which are squatter maybe two stories and sort of i suppose rectangular or else big colossal things like you'd get um, in some of the Clamell buildings, but more particularly in parts of Kilkenny, they have some massive mill buildings uh, in Kilkenny. Kells, for example, the town of Kells has a, a fantastic bridge, which is two periods, but you have a couple of really big mills right beside it. It's worth going just for the industrial archaeology, as they call it, or industrial heritage. So this one has obviously the mill, uh, the mill wheel itself. So you get different types of mill wheel. Some of them uh, where the water comes in about midway, breast shot some that come in over it, which would be overshot, and then undershot is where the water is feeding in from the base. It is a windmill, again up in, up in North Tip. So this, this windmill is, there are not too many uh, windmills in the county, they're all stumps. None of them have their gearing and their sails or, and that sort of thing. But this is, this is a really good example of you know, a flared side mill. There are, there are somewhat earlier ones which are parallel sided. They can be 17th or early 18th century. Um, this one would be later. This would be sort of late 18th or early 19th century. So you do get different types of mills and different datings. And then this is in Slivarda area. I could have put up the copper, the steeple of copper. Sorry, sorry, sorry guys. But um, I put up this one. This is from uh, Mardike which was the, I think the earliest of the coal mines in the Slivarda Hills. Slivarda Hills are really a very interesting part of the county. And uh, they, they straddle the, the border with uh, the, the Kilkenny people as well. But the, on the tip side, there's a really excellent history and heritage of coal mining. And we have a couple of people here now from the Coal Mining Museum in the Commons. And uh, they have, uh, so that's worth visiting, and they have a lovely website. Uh, so you have engine houses and chimneys, which dispelled uh, noxious fumes and so on out of the, and, and water out of the mines. They didn't last very long. They set them up and they'd last X number of years, and then they'd have to move on to the next load of coal. The coal was always quite shallow. Uh, the seams were quite thin. Uh, the town of New Birmingham was established more in hope than anything else. Uh, that it would be a, a major industrial centre. Unfortunately, the village was built on the edge, not in the centre of things, so it couldn't really thrive on uh, any substantial amount of coal. There was also a plea to have uh, a spur line from the Dublin Cork line to uh, serve it. That never happened, so that was sort of its death knell. Something similar is there at um, Fedder, just outside of Fedder, at Kiltynan. There is a chimney of brickworks, but it seems to have been the only bit of the brickworks that was ever established. Again, they had wanted to have a spur line, but that didn't happen. So they, they wanted to be in on the Railway Act, and if you're not in on the Railway Act, it didn't, it didn't happen. But we have them as legacies of industrial heritage. And this is a little building in Ross Cray, a very quirky uh, 20th century building. I'm not entirely sure, I forget what it was for. But it's an interesting structure in its own right. Again, like, would it get onto a record of protective structures? Would it get into a, a book about architecture? Personally, I think it should. <laughs> uh, so the transport angle, this is the station in Ross Cray. Really nice one. The, attend to, the different lines tend to have a sort of a, a branding which identified all the stations and other structures on the line. Again, showy architecture. They want to show that they were a company that could be relied upon. We're going to get you there safely because look at our buildings. They're well built. You know, they exude confidence and, and, and wealth. Banks are part of the same 
um, sort of genre, I suppose. The railway bridges, most of them, have, I think, have been bypassed now by modern bridges with lifts like the one in Turles, uh, which is a real pity because the, the old bridge was very handy for when you, the train was actually in the station and you, you were in a mad hurry. So these were fantastic, but I suppose they were probably a little bit slippy. They didn't um, facilitate people who were not great in their pins or who had prams or wheelchairs and, and so on. But they are worth hanging on to and really looking after and, and protecting. This is a little, what's called a wheel guard or a jostle stone. This is in Boris uh, the building right in the middle of the square. And the jostle stones, sorry, not a milestone, not a jostle stone. It's actually a jostle stone and a milestone. Jostle stone or wheel guard is for protecting the corner of a building from carts or other vehicles which were turning the corner that the hub wouldn't dislocate stones or render from the corner. Um, this one is also a milestone. Quite a few of them around, but again, they can disappear quite quickly. And you say, oh, where's that stone gone? And it'll be dumped somewhere. So it, people have to be vigilant about all of these things, particularly this type of street furniture. And I mentioned concrete earlier. This is um, a bridge over sort of Bansha care direction. And it's a concrete bridge from, I think, about 1933, so sure. It's a really, it's a really nice bridge. There's, there's an, yeah, there's an old such and such bridge and there's a new such and such bridge. And this is the new such and such bridge. Uh, I said earlier that I'm not going to remember every single structure uh, by name, but it has on each side a little stepped uh, access to the river. So it's a, this is a really, this is definitely part of the architectural heritage. And it, without, without a doubt, this is a, a really nice structure. There's a lot of nice details to it. Still functioning as a, as a, as a bridge today, a, a vehicular bridge. Then this is on Loch Derg, um, drum and ear direction. It's a little goods shed for the water traffic that was on Loch Derg. So there's a, if you like, there's a sort of a maritime or lacustrine heritage as well as the rivers per se, with our heritage of mills and bridges. And of course, boating traditions, which sort of doesn't really come that closely into the architectural heritage, but is part of, of the heritage in general. So now we're just on to churches. It's not, it's not a church that too many people would necessarily recognize. I pass it by umpteen times. One particular time I happened to pass it by, and it was at night time, and there was somebody inside it, and I could see that there was a beautiful stained glass window. The light from inside showed up the stained glass, which you couldn't see during the day. And so I made a very particular point of visiting that and having a look at the interior. So it's got, it's got nice, very nice stained glass windows on the inside, uh, which I'm not actually, actually showing you. <laughs> uh, and then this is part of the interior of St. Michael's in Tiptown, which is an extraordinary Ruridos. Another really good Ruridos or backdrop to the altar, or high altar, is uh, in the church in Killinall, St. Mary's in Killinall which is a, an absolute cracker and perfectly preserved. Also has a pulpit that was made by the Pierce brothers, uh, Willie and Patrick Pierce. So that's um, something to, to bear in mind as well. So that's a link with um, 1916. And then this is the interior of, I think it's Cashel Church of Ireland, church. Again, um, a lot plainer, but you will get some nice stained glass. You'll get good pulpits. Um, the seating can be uh, of a good, uh, a good order as well, but n never quite as exuberant as the interior of Catholic churches. They just, they're, they're just different. So this is actually this, this illustration top right is from the Clefical Church. So this it shows a rather famous building, and Hor Abbey at the foot, and then there. There were specialists, obviously, the likes of Harry Clark, and there were various other firms. There were also foreign firms as well that provided, for example, gilt work or mosaic work for churches. And I'm thinking of, say, Borisolay Church in particular. So a, a lot of the detailing was uh, done to commission by different firms. And then we have a, a very old church, old St. Mary's in, in, uh, in uh, Clonmel which has an obviously ancient uh, medieval building, but the whole, the whole thing is largely uh, medieval in date, with uh, annexes and bits and pieces added over time, which is very typical. And in a lovely graveyard with uh, the town wall on a couple of sides of it. 
So it's a real hot spot. Something similar is the case in Feathered, where you have um, uh, one of the most intact medieval churches in Ireland with uh, a 15th century roof and tower. And again, you've got a lovely graveyard, which is an oasis of calm, bounded on a couple of sides again by the town wall. So it's, it has a very similar sort of atmosphere. And then we have this is the Morrisons. The, there, was, um, there, were two, there were two brothers uh, called Morrison. There was, there was Richard and there was William, who was known as Vitruvius. And so he named himself, or was named after, an ancient Roman uh, architect from the first century BC, who was rather, um, rather famous and wrote about his trade of, of architecture. So it was a bit of a sort of, um, uh, a bit cheeky. Which is, which is still standing? Nope, gone. And unfortunately, quite, quite a few buildings from that, that era are gone. They were, they were often called pasteboard castles because they were sort of imitations of medieval castles, but not very good imitations. They were too formal, uh, too formal in um, quality and too sort of classical. So these are just details from the building. So this is the gardens in uh, Templemore. And then this is Britta's Castle between uh, Turles and Templemore which is a, a really splendid, not a ruin, but it's a mock ruin of a medieval castle. It's just a really, really uh, nice spot. It's, it's private property, so you can't necessarily get in and, and have a, a look around. It's, this is the moat of the, the, mock, the mock castle. So there was this penchant for building mock ruins and so on. Thomas Town, which is still there, quite ruinous, but it's the largest and most intact of what remains of those buildings, certainly in tip. Fireplace, really grand, sort of uh, neo-medieval, but with uh, classical bits, uh, nevertheless. So really exuberant. This is the architecture of people who had probably too much money and uh, a little bit less sense. So now we're on to the Tinsleys. Interestingly, the Morrisons, one of the Morrisons was born in Clonmel, the, and his son was born in, uh, in Cork, but there was two architects born in Clamell. One of them was one of the Morrisons and then the Tinsleys. And the Tinsleys were a really important uh, family of architects, not just in Tip, but also young Tinsley went off to the States and became a big architect for very large institutional buildings, colleges and uh, psychiatric hospitals and all the rest of it. And a major influence on institutional architecture in the States. Now, fortunately, their own house in Clonmel is gone, and that's really regrettable. But the, the footprint of it could be marked out because it's not built on. It seems to be in, um, you know, tarmac and a grassed area. But I, I'd like to see that someday presented. A Tullamane, it's a drawing of Tullamane Castle near Feathered. And then this is just down the road, this is Tortulla. And then this is Marlfield. So very different buildings. So, you know, these are, these are a firm of architects, a family of architects who are very, very uh, versatile. So they could go from Neo-Tudor to, um, you know, sort of ultra castellated and then to grandly formal uh, Palladian. And then just generally on the, so the architecture of the big house, you have a, a whole, Myriad gateways, gate lodges of all sorts of styles, from the simple to the very elaborate. So this one is, I think it's Killeskeen. Is it Killeskeen? It's near Templemore. Uh, a gateway to a formal yard of, um, but it's, I suppose it's, it's just a grand entrance to something which is very functional, a farmyard. But you can see the details that echo uh, the external details, you have pedestrian entrance, vehicular entrance, um, higher probably than it needs to be, unless you had maybe a hay float or something going in, and then nice details to the lintling of the openings. This is another farmyard, really, um, really pleasant. The architecture of formal farmyards is very different to that for vernacular farmyards. Vernacular farmyards, one story, a very simple appearance, and obviously the uh, the, the houses, the buildings of the ancillary buildings of houses will reflect the architecture of the houses. So then a folly. 
it's a little it's yeah, it's more of it's more of a little tea house they would call it rather than a rather than a dovecot as such. Dovecot would just have one entrance, but this is more like a little tea house, a little point in the landscape. And then uh, this is an entrance way into a walled garden. Walled gardens are often really beautiful spaces. And there's, uh, there's one near Feathered, which is actually an oval shape. But generally speaking, they're square or rectangular, but they really are a very, very pleasant part of the accoutrements and the environs of, uh, of the big house. Then we're getting at the, the vernacular then. So this is a little vernacular house, very typical, two windows, a door and a window. This one is a quite, least quite a steep pitched roof. It's near Muldoon. So uh, thatched houses and thatched buildings generally have taken an awful battering uh, since about 1950s for a whole raft of reasons. Probably mostly psychological. The psychological factor of, you know, not being seen as modern, uh, coupled with the, uh, the difficulties in continual maintenance of a material which uh, likes to get damp, <laughs> you know, is, a, is an issue. Then, of course, more recently, insurance problems, uh, lack of thatchers. Uh, this is also a vernacular house, a little bit um, uh, more formalized, but both of them, as you can see, have the chimney more or less in line with the doorway, and that's a very typical type of plant form in South Tip. Uh, in fact, sorry, all of Tip. It's an Eastern plan. It's called Lobby Entry or Heart Lobby House. And you'll find it from about Loch Ney all the way down to sort of East Cork, even East Galway. And then in uplands and in more Western areas, you have a different plan form called the, the Direct Entry, where you would have the chimney probably here, say. You go in the door and the fireplace is off to one side. So there are two quite different types of house. So this is a house uh, in Midtip. It's not too far from here. It's what I'm showing here is the very pleasant farmyard setting. Intact timber sash windows. I hope they're still there. And then really nice gateway, sort of slightly formal, nice piers. Uh, it's all very nicely presented. And that's what we want to keep. And then this is Drangan, a really lovely um, structure in Drangan. One of my favorite things in County Tipperary, actually. So you have a pump on steps, you've got a well in here, and every, the whole place is uh, well presented. <laughs> so it's a, uh, and there's a few cattle for good measure. Um, there's uh, also a very nice well just outside of Killinall, which I only saw a few years ago, and I've been passing it by, I'd say hundreds of times before that. It's really nice, it's called Tubercallion, the girls' well, and it's, it's down below um, road level with a little arched entrance into the, into the well and steps down. So a really nice little feature. Uh, farmyards, all sorts of different shapes and sizes. In Tipperary, they tend to be courtyards of various forms. The hay barn, one of the most iconic of all Irish buildings, ranking with the round tower or the, the medieval tower house as a particular, and the bungalow as a particularly Irish form. So this has quite a defensive sort of feel to it. The dwelling house is here. You enter through the gateway here, and then there'll be gateway possibly into the, into the land, I'd say, at the back here. Now, this is a four bay, four, four bay hay barn. Uh, the most common would be a three bay. But in parts of the west, you might get a two bay or a one bay. They're much more common. So three bays, four bays and upwards are a sign of, you know, uh, serious farming territory with good land and lots of tillage and so on. So the, the hay barns are a, they're a beloved structure. I probably love them more than most. So a variety of farm machinery in yards, uh, which should never be cleaned away. Over cleaning farm yards is bad news. Uh, there's lots of bits and pieces that should be hung onto, even if they're broken. And then here's a little churn stand. Now this is from uh, Spansel Hill actually in uh, County Clare. But there's, there's various of them around. There's a very nice one there at, oh, what's the name of that castle? Just outside of Killinall. Gravestown. Yeah, at the junction there at Gravestown, opposite the castle, there is a, there's a very nice example of a churn stand. And it's got a, a surveyor's uh, crow's foot built into it, a sort of a mounting point for 
the, uh, the staff for doing survey work uh, built into it. And then here's a, a few querns, domestic hand querns. So th these are scattered throughout the county. Uh, sometimes they're built into walls, sometimes they're in, a, in an outbuilding. And these are an example of you like home milling, domestic milling, where people just ground for themselves. And in two of them, you can see that these are top stones because they have the hole for putting in a little wooden handle for rotating the quern. So there was a fair amount of effort required. And then uh, a couple of base stones. So again, like, like street furniture in towns, this stuff is an important part of memory, agricultural memory and local and rural memory. That's all very fine. We've got this fantastic heritage, but what are we doing about it? So we have, obviously, county development plans are pretty important part of the infrastructure for protecting buildings. Now, TIP has suffered in not having an architectural conservation officer. There are few counties of the size of TIP that don't have an architectural conservation officer. There was one in South TIP at one point, and then there was a heritage officer in each of the two TIPs. Now we're reduced to one heritage officer for the entirety, and that's it. Now, the county has, I believe, advertised for an architectural conservation officer, and I hope we get one, because it's sorely needed. Uh, counties that don't have such a person are at a real disadvantage and that the people who own heritage buildings are at a real disadvantage. The County Development Plan, which is a consolidated North and Tip, North Tip and South Tip plan is in place at the moment. It's got another four years or so to run. This is the front of, the, I think it's volume, yeah, volume four, which is the uh, built heritage end of it, the record of protective structures. There is, it's all, it's all a bit too urban for my liking. It's not really that representative and they're all grand buildings. So to me, that's not a good sign <laughs> for a development plan. So the ingredients, I suppose, are, okay, local authority, policy and practice. How does the local authority go about protecting the architectural heritage of the county? What are its policies and then what is its practice? Policies are fine, but how they're translated to practice is very important. The record of protective structures is the statutory list for any given local authority, which lists out buildings, structures, etc., that the council deems to be of interest. Now, the vast majority of these will have been supplied by the National Inventory of Architectural Heritage, but a sign of uh, a maturing position would be where the council uh, continues to upgrade it, continues to add stuff to it, uh, rather than, say, docking wholesale, which unfortunately did happen. The National Inventory of Architectural Heritage, who I work with, have again have, a, have had a role in providing local authorities with really well worked out lists, uh, descriptions and photographs and so on of, of architecture around the country. We have a website which is called www.buildingsofireland.ie that gives a really good presentation of the architectural heritage, a really strong visual representation of, of the architectural heritage of the county of Tipperary. There is the National Strategy of Built Vernacular Heritage, which uh, I wrote myself, to deal with uh, vernacular architecture, vernacular heritage around the, around the country. So I would hope that the council would have cognizance of this document, for example. It's not mentioned in the county development plan. Perhaps uh, it arrived too late for it. National policy then. In general, there is a national policy which says, don't demolish buildings. It is wasteful, it's not sustainable. The department has uh, a series of grant programs. So there's the Historic Structures Fund, there's the Built Heritage Investment Scheme. There are two schemes relating to vernacular architecture, which have come in as part of the strategy on the basis that the vast bulk of the vernacular heritage is not protected. Other schemes have had to be brought in to show, look, these things are important as well. So all of this depends on well-trained planners the first line of defence is the planning staff of any local authority. If the planning staff are cognizant of something or aware of something being important or of interest, we're halfway there. If they don't see that a particular structure is of any interest, well then we're on hiding to nothing. This has happened, unfortunately, all too commonly in every part of the country, not just in Tipperary. Architectural conservation officer, none as yet in the county. We had one for about five years or less and wasn't replaced, but hopefully there will be a conservation officer 
Architectural Conservation Officer soon in the county. Heritage Officer, we have a Heritage Officer. Uh, then local authority management interest is very, very important. So if the upper echelons of the county guess what architectural heritage is about, well then we're set. Uh, the elected members, a lot depends on the elected members' interest because the record of protective structures is voted on by the members. If somebody makes a, a representation to a member of the local authority to delist something from the record of protective structures, almost invariably it's delisted. It's an issue in um, other counties more necessarily than it is in TIP. Owner's interest. If an owner has a building which is of heritage value but doesn't want it or finds it a nuisance, well then that's obviously a big, big issue. And then there's the general public and the media. To what extent does the media present uh, material re relevant and related to the architectural heritage? And to what degree is that information and presentation accurate? And I would have uh, strong misgivings about the accuracy of many presentations with regard to the architectural heritage. So there's a, there's a job of work to be done on all those different levels. And then we have um, uh, cottages, labourers' cottages from the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, unfortunately, there's been open season on these. I'm not going to say where any of these are. So what we have now is it's gone from that to that. Um, this house has gone from that to that. Now, I would say that there has been a loss. You know, something has been lost here. So chimneys are essential. I know there is a whole move to stop people from lighting fires for environmental reasons and so on, but chimneys are essential. If you're not going to use it, don't remove it, keep it. External insulation is not necessarily a good thing. It's not proven. The jury is still out, in my opinion. Beware the Trojan house, not the Trojan horse, the Trojan house. Many a labourer's cottage is bought with view to essentially uh, building uh, an extension which will be X times the size of the original building. So the labourer's cottage becomes a sort of a bit of an add-on <laughs> to something which is far, far bigger. I've seen examples, and the same is true of vernacular houses, where extensions uh, up to five to ten times the size of the original building are proposed. And then this, uh, there was um, on uh, a television there recently, there was an example of a house in the West. So it went from that to that. They even straightened and leveled off the tops of the openings, utterly um, you know, rubbing the house's nose in it. Absolutely, totally um, nonsensical. Uh, the chimneys went, the entire roof was replaced and it was presented as an example of how people uh, might tackle an old house. This is not an example of how to tackle an old house. This is destruction. The interior was gutted, the roof lost, the chimney's gone, the window, the entire look of the facade um, destroyed. This is not good work. However, to end on a, a more pleasant note, um, this is a building up in North Donegal. It's a little vernacular house um, with probably originally a little outbuilding added. And this is what we have. Now, we're too used to the situation happening in reverse, that it goes from this to that. But this has gone, and this is the, the architect, Dun Duncan McLaren, uh, who has been doing really gentle work, what I call gentle rehabilitation of old buildings. Uh, good work should be invisible. <laughs> you know, you should think, oh, they, they haven't done anything to that house. That's actually a sign of good work. Uh, I'm reminded of the main garden in Clonmel, where the OPW has spent about a million on works to the basement. And lots of people are saying, they haven't done anything with it, they haven't spent any money on it. But what they had done was the most important work, which was hidden and invisible. That was the important work. So they, um, 
So th this sort of this sort of work is really, um, I think, impressive. This is the way we need to go. People, for example, taking the render off buildings and exposing stonework. Render is there for a purpose. So this is, I think, a really good example of how you can produce something which is really good, really satisfying, and really uh, sustainable from the uh, from the heritage, and really showing respect and understanding. Anyway, Shinawil.